Surveillance breeds conformity. Um, Glenn Greenwald has said, in my own work, I've I have described the possibility of a national panopticon where the internet transforms the entire country into a prison. But this summer's revelations risk making the entire world subject to Bentham's and Foucault's disciplinary mechanism. I want to focus my remarks here yet not on the corrosive effects of surveillance on liberty, but on their effects on commerce. My argument here is premised on the idea that governments are more likely to be moved by arguments based on commerce than ones based on liberty. So in my book, The Electronic Silk Road, uh, which I've, uh, I have a few copies available here, if uh, anyone wants some afterwards, uh, I, uh, for uh, just 20 bucks, I guess. Uh, so uh, I argue that the internet should herald the greatest free trade zone in history, as well as the world's greatest free speech zone. But of course, only so long as the governments of the world let it. And this afternoon, I want to discuss the role of surveillance in undermining the promise of this electronic Silk Road. I'm presenting here both part of the last chapter of my book, but also a new paper um, that I've co-authored with my colleague, uh, Wynne Lei, who is here as well. So my book takes us on a journey along the electronic Silk Road from Silicon Valley here to India with various stops in between. The last chapter poses a puzzle. When China has become factory to the world, why did it not also become the services supplier to the world? So this is an issue uh, that I think is a central one for, dis for thinking about uh, the various parts of the Silk Road today. After all, China is full of successful homegrown internet enterprises, many of which are worth billions and billions of dollars, in fact, are the key to Yahoo's valuation today. Um, yet of these, only one, Alibaba, is a real global trader, and then largely to offer Chinese products to uh, people abroad or foreign products to people in China. Most of the companies don't even bother to offer a version of their website in English or in any other language than Chinese. Even when listing their stock on the New York stock markets, they declare only an intention to conquer China and not the world. Um, so Baidu tells us it's a leading Chinese language internet search provider. Tencent describes itself as a leading provider of internet and mobile and telecommunications value-added services in China. Now compare this language with what you know of Silicon Valley, and you know the mighty ambitions there, here, I should say, Google describes itself as a global technology leader. Facebook declares its mission to make the world more open and connected. Right? The global ambition is, is baked into the uh, very uh, essence of the company. In fact, China runs a huge trade deficit in services. Okay? So we think of its enormous trade surplus. But with respect to services, it's actually a huge consumer of services um, from abroad. Um, and so this, the trade deficit of services is some and, uh, $90 billion. It exports $190 billion of commercial services while importing $280 billion of commercial services just this, in 2012. So what keeps Chinese companies from accomplishing in services what they've done in manufacturing? So uh, there are some obvious answers, and I want to reflect on those first. Um, come on in. Uh, the Chinese companies are merely copycats, simply replicating uh, an idea born in Silicon Valley and uh, localizing it within China. But of course, there's an element of truth in this explanation, but it is incomplete. Silicon Valley itself is not immune to copycats. Facebook, for example, was hardly the world's first social network, as anyone who remembers Friendster or MySpace or even Korea's SciWorld will know. When the web service Snapchat, as you all know, uh, refused Facebook's buyout offer recently, uh, Facebook simply 
cloned the service. It's called, it's the new version of poke uh, on Facebook. So another possible explanation for limited ambitions of Chinese companies is language. Um, but the fact is that language is something that Americans are not particularly good at either. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, I don't think that can be the, the crucial uh, dividing uh, line between American internet providers and Chinese ones. So what I want to suggest instead is another uh, explanation. So, so this explanation focuses on the nature of services themselves. So the nature of services is that they involve lots of data, right? Uh, data that can often be far more personal than what is embedded in goods. So uh, the service providers of Silicon Valley, for example, deal in consumer and business data. They store photos and documents, deliver letters, connect friends and colleagues, and find things across the internet. You, many of the details of our lives are now data that passes through Silicon Valley companies. Who knows you better than Google, right? Um, would we trust such information to a Chinese internet company? The difficulty is not necessarily that the Chinese companies are likely to be worse stewards than American ones. That would be an open question. But that they must abide by the dictates of a government that is not directly accountable to the people. And also that this government has few restraints on local snooping. In this way, the Chinese censorship and surveillance regime undermines China's services exports. So I know that many of you may be thinking about uh, uh, WeChat, a uh, messaging app that's become uh, fairly popular across the world, even in the United States, and especially across Southeast Asia. But its owner, the, ten, the company Tencent, uh, provides, and so this is the, the uh, graph I should have shown earlier. Um, so, I'm <laughs> behind here. Um, Tencent executives insist that the risks of spying are small because they don't store information on their servers, right? So the way that they are trying to uh, curtail concerns about uh, spying, about surveillance, is to say, we don't store information, okay? Now this, of course, leaves open a lot of questions. This statement is, is, uh, begs more questions than it answers, right? Uh, but, uh, but you can see that the, there's reasons uh, that they need to be uh, thinking about these and trying to calm potential consumers. So my thesis uh, in the last chapter of the book is that the Great Firewall of China not only keeps American internet companies out of China, it keeps Chinese companies in. So the claim about data insecurity in the hands of a government is of course now being made about the United States. Uh, so here is uh, uh, the the European Commissioner. Sorry, okay. Um, the European Commissioner uh, uh, Vivian Redding uh, says um, Europeans may stop using American companies entirely. And so after the revelations uh, of this last summer from uh, from Mr. Snowden, President Obama sought to comfort the American people. He told us. With respect to the internet and emails, this does not apply to US citizens, and it does not apply to people living in the United States. That's President Obama on June 7th. But imagine what this says to people who are outside the United States who are not US citizens. By the way, the fact that uh, President Obama is a constitutional law uh, professor is evident in this very statement. Uh, because it's carefully, it's incredibly, you think this is a throwaway line, but it's actually carefully calibrated to cor correspond with the constitutional law on the subject, uh, the Fourth Amendment constraints that, he, that, he's, uh, that, he's, that are at issue here. Um, so, so reflect again what this says to a Canadian or a Brazilian or a German. Can we treat you as a potential terrorist simply because you aren't, you aren't a U.S. citizen or resident? Uh, just because you're a foreign shouldn't mean you're suspect. So what I want to do is for, is, for the remainder of my remarks, talk about um, two things. One, um, 
the actual restraints, well known, on US surveillance abroad. Okay? Uh, and the ultimate, uh, the, obviously, the, the, uh, you could already see what I'm going to say. Essentially, that there are none. Okay? Uh, so I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to talk about uh, the responses to this. So what are, US, what are legal constraints in US surveillance abroad? We can look at international law. We can look at uh, constitutional law. So, and, here. <laughs> all right, international law, US constitutional law, US federal statutes, and US executive orders. And I will march through this in, in one or two minutes. So, uh, so you'll excuse the rapidity with which I proceed. So with, inter with respect to international law, the law of espionage is remarkably unclear. So scholars are really quite divided on the legality of espionage in international law. Though, of course, I think the, the, the simple conclusion might be intelligence lies at the edge of international legitimacy. Uh, and this is Simon Chesterman's uh, uh, discussion in 2006. So whether it's on one side or other of that edge, it may be somewhat unclear. Uh, but that it may well be uh, illegal under international law. The difficulty, of course, in, in this context is any kind of uh, enforce, enforcement mechanism. There have been also uh, suggestions by the UN rapporteurs on the subject that the surveillance, this mass surveillance, um, violates freedom of expression and the right to privacy. Uh, and so, so those are uh, also at risk. But again, the worry there is that there are no, they, they don't serve as effective constraints on US actions abroad, whatever the international law constraints actually are. Now, with respect to US constitutional constraints, um, and uh, it's a fascinating case, this case of Verdugo Urquidez, a uh, Mexican citizen challenged evidence obtained and being used against him, uh, obtained in a warrantless search of his home in Mexico. Uh, and so the Supreme Court ruled that he was not one of the, quote, people protected by the Fourth Amendment. Uh, and so by not having ties, substantial ties to the United States, he was not protected by the Fourth Amendment. Uh, and so he could not exclude this evidence that was obtained without a warrant. So the constitutional constraints uh, fall thereby. Now, with respect to US statutes, you've all heard about the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. But the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act is an act designed to empower foreign intelligence surveillance, not to limit it, especially with respect to foreign intelligence. In other words, the limitations of FISA are wherever it intersects with Americans. That's where the minimization and, tar and targeting requirements arise. So you can do whatever you want abroad. We just have to minimize and target so that you don't get information about Americans. Right? Uh, so when we in the United States complain about FISA, we have much fewer constraint, complaints, really, than everyone elsewhere, because FISA does nothing for them. Okay. Um, so and then US executive orders, um, there's an executive order 12333. Uh, but again, the executive order here uh, is focused on uh, limiting. So this is some details here. Um, on limiting uh, the uh, actions with respect to Americans, essentially, and authorizing actions in other contexts. The end result, and I love this quote, um, Outside the United States, the CIA prowls the alleys without a leash, right? Um, and so, so this is the, the reality that's faced by people outside, the, by non-US citizens outside the United States. Okay. And you can see the, 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 uh, what this means, huge, uh, evidence of surveillance all over the world by the United States. 
Um, and so some of the recent revelations uh, are, are showing evidence of where we're collecting information from. Given that most of humanity lives outside the United States, that's, uh, that means that we're surveilling most of humanity. OK. So what you see is a response around the world then. And the response consists in a variety of actions. Um, and so, um, and largely, uh, we, we characterize them as data localization, an effort to bring data home. Don't let it go to the United States. Okay. That's the mandate, the new mantra from around the world. Uh, and so what we've done is we've surveyed uh, more than a dozen countries not surveyed as in uh, sent a survey team or something like that. We've examined the laws and policies of um, 14 different jurisdictions to see what's happening in those, in those jurisdictions. And this is just an indicative list here. OK, so Russia. Uh, there, um, there is our efforts to, uh, to pass digital sovereignty legislation requiring servers containing Russian users' personal information to be located in Russia. Okay. So that various spies, intelligence services, and swindlers can't make use of the difference in legislative approaches and not answer the questions that our investigators and court systems have. Um, of course, Russia is not immune to having homegrown swindlers uh, in, involved with the internet, uh, one might note. Brazil. The new Marco Civil, the uh, internet, um, the Marco Civil was intended to be a revolutionary statement of rights of internet users when it was first pr proposed by Ronaldo Lemos, uh, an academic in Brazil. But now the new, uh, new provision there, uh, at the, the suggestion, uh, in fact, of President Dilma Rousseff, is that the executive branch, through decree may force connection providers and internet application providers to install or use structures for storage, management, and dissemination of information in the country. And she says, uh, uh, pointedly to the United States, uh, if you haven't seen her speech at the United Nations, you should. It's a remarkable speech. Um, it uh, strikes me as every bit as important as Khrushchev taking his shoe and banging it on the podium of the, of the, of the UN. Um, uh, and she says, clearly, Petrobras is not a threat to the security of any country. Okay. Talking about US leaks that suggest that the US was surveilling uh, entities like Petrobras. Why the United States explains, uh, third parties um, who once worked for the United States explain why you might surveil Petrobras, because this is a matter of energy security. right? Uh, but it shows you how, how broad the security mandate uh, uh, covers, right? Clearly, no one thinks of Petrobras as a kind of terrorist organization or uh, pr providing fun money to terrorism. In India, uh, there are ways to, uh, efforts to route domestic internet traffic within, uh, within servers within the country and further efforts to require government data to be placed within the country. Um, and of course, the, the goal here, again, uh, to prevent the capacity of foreigners to scrutinize intra-India traffic. In Germany, Deutsche Telekom, and this is the most kind of nakedly self-interested uh, protectionist uh, 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 proposal here, Deutsche Telekom is pushing to shield internet traffic from spies by routing it through German servers, helpfully owned by Deutsche Telekom. Um, outrage, of course, followed revelations that U.S. surveillance programs had accessed the private messages of German citizens. Um, and so, and, and the next step, this could be expanded to the Schengen area. That's the, that's the uh, proposal. Um, and our worry here is that the anger about foreign surveillance, quite justified, quite justified, uh, is resulting in uh, a response that will ultimately undo the web itself. It will break apart the web into uh, narrow fiefdoms. And this is quite dangerous for a number of reasons that we'll describe. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to uh, touch on five. Um, first, 
the most obvious uh, point. All I told you about limitations on US spying abroad should tell you that placing this information in Germany, Brazil, India, etc., does not immunize it from the reach of US spies. In fact, US spies largely operate overseas. So uh, there are actually fewer constraints on US op operations abroad because the data is less likely to be intermingled with American data. Right? So if you have American data on the same system, then you're going to have to follow different procedures than if it's lar largely German data or Brazilian data, et cetera. Uh, so uh, so uh, it seems um, it, Germans might actually be safer than transferring their data to the United States uh, in order to keep it from uh, uh, American hands. Local services may have weaker security. Right? This is, uh, I think, a, a really important point, uh, and it's you know, fairly self-evident when one considers um, the results of protectionism. So the results of protectionism have historically been uh, building local companies that don't face uh, the same uh, competitive concerns that companies engaged in international uh, competition uh, are necessarily faced with. Uh, and such companies may well have uh, then local uh, services, servers that are more vulnerable to NSA or other surveillance uh, than, uh, than, uh, foreign, um, than foreign services which are designed um, to ward off US surveillance. Um, so call this the, from borrowing the, uh, this morning's head headlines, the angry birds uh, problem. Um, a third problem is the honeypot that it creates. By localizing everything on servers, uh, everything about Brazilians on local data farms, it creates a wonderful place, rich, uh, uh, treasure rich, uh, uh, I, should, I should say target rich, to use the, uh, the military terminology, uh, environment. Uh, and rather than the, the, the approaches of companies, uh, that the global services that, sh that use processes like data sharding, where stuff is splintered uh, into thousands of different places uh, and made uh, more inaccessible through that, through that process. Um, thus, in large part, then, sur the, the surveillance undermines rather than increases security. Now, it should also be clear that data localization interferes with the cutting edge technologies of cloud computing, big data analytics, and the internet of things. All the things that are driving Silicon Valley uh, in 2014. Um, all of these technologies depend upon the ready flow of data across borders. Uh, when you buy a Fitbit in, in Canada, for, for example, it says, the, the, the terms of service say, we send all our information to the United States, right? Uh, is Fitbit now going to create different Fitbits that are localized for every country? Uh, it seems unlikely, at least at this point, but it seems rather costly uh, in general. Uh, and the promise of the Internet of Things becomes uh, far uh, more remote. And there's a, now returning to my uh, first observation about um, uh, liberty, because it is really what's uh, the motivation behind uh, this work. There's a more sinister possibility as well. Um, data localization increases local control over the internet. One of the great virtues of the internet was that it made possible the ability to access global services when those services might be, uh, might lead to uh, kind of uh, prosecution at home. Now, so it empowers then governments to target the op opposition that much more precisely. Okay. So just in the way I uh, ask you to, to visualize this, uh, imagine Chris Christie now with the power of the N NSA. Okay. Uh, so, and uh, coupled with data localization, right? So 
there's tremendous room for concern. Uh, I think the rest of the world should be dramatically concerned. The law is uh, abysmal. Uh, and so, but the question is, what is the, what is the response? Uh, I don't think uh, breaking the web is the appropriate response to the problems that we have. Thank you. So questions. Go first. Elaine is uh, walking around the mic. Hi, I'm incredibly cynical. It seems to me that this inter uh, gets into laws of war and laws of tremendous economic profit. So I wonder whether any of these attempts will give anybody security that uh, material within a country will be taken by whatever government. Uh, material crossing a boundary will be pirated off on that boundary. And so, you know, I don't, I question whether anything other than uh, paranoid uh, localization will do anything. Okay, so uh, the, you're so worried about what happens as data flows across borders, uh, you might then say, that's just, we should just sh shut off that spigot. Uh, and uh, and if, I'm trying to just make sure I capture your question properly first. Um, and so, um, so we need to, uh, every country should try to kind of uh, wall itself off, create these kind of checkpoint Charlies for data uh, so that you can't, uh, so that it doesn't cross into enemy hands, essentially. Uh, and so, so that's, the, that's the concern. Well, I think experience should tell us that really um, the NSA, if it wants access to information, whatever the reforms Obama has hinted at, whether they actually materialize it or not, uh, the reforms are unlikely to stop to stay the hand of the NSA uh, in dramatic fashion when it wants to access data abroad, right? So that putting your stuff on a local server uh, in uh, in uh, Brazil or Indonesia or Germany or France is no guarantee of safety uh, at all. Uh, and so, uh, so there's now the fact is there's no guarantee of safety. Period. Okay. So that's absolutely the case. But the question is whether it's the, uh, there is actually any payoff from localizing, uh, and two, what are the, uh, the harms that arise from localizing? I don't think there really, I think there are actually uh, more harms to the, to the goal of security uh, from localizing than there are to, uh, to uh, placing it on global services. So this means that, um, so what you've seen, um, you know, Eric Schmidt say, you know, uh, essentially Google is encrypting everything, right? End-to-end -end encryption. Uh, and so, uh, and Google is developing, of course, you know, incredibly sophisticated encryption mechanisms. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, Google or Facebook, et cetera, are, are doing this for noble, pur noble purposes, but they have an economic interest uh, here, which is clearly at stake, which is, their, their interests are not aligned with the American government's interests, right? The American government's interests uh, uh, are, are, are different than companies that want to attract data to these services. And so these services have an enormous uh, vested interest in uh, trying to assure the world that their data is safe. We saw even Tencent saying, look, your data is not being stored by us at all, right? Uh, so all these companies know that they have to promise you something because the nature of services is uh, that there's all this personal information that's being transmitted at all times. 
Hi, how are you? Nice to see you. Um, so my question goes back to what you were saying in the beginning of the talk about the economics of surveillance. Um, and, and I'm wondering what you think is going to happen because of a couple of things being true. Um, one is, you know, you talked about a, a government's responsiveness to its citizens um, and people's concerns about information getting into the hands of the government. And one thing that might be true is I might be a lot less concerned about Chinese government surveillance of me than I am about the U.S. government surveillance of me. Um, another issue might be that no government really is responsive to foreigners, yet because the Internet is global, um, foreigners' information travels across national internets and is stored with different national internet companies. The United States has just happened to be the most successful so far. Maybe that's because people had the misperception that <clears throat> average regular people's information wasn't of interest to the U.S. government, where it might be of interest to a Chinese government or a Soviet Union government or something, you know, Russian government or Iranian or whatever. But now we know that that's not true. At the same time, we're still not going to be able to pressure other governments to do better for our privacy, and foreigners aren't having a great time of pressuring the U.S. government to do better for their privacy. So, so what's going to happen? I mean, it, what will this mean that, um, you know, what's the market say, I guess, is my question. Where, what do you see the economic pressures being now that we have this information about actual surveillance practices? So what you're seeing, of course, in the marketplace is companies that are coming in and saying, we offer safety and security for your data. Right? Use our email service because it's so much more secure than the competitor service. So, uh, you know, Google is saying this, you know, again and again, you know, it's saying our encryption is the, uh, you know, world's best. Uh, so, uh, the companies are, are, are competing with each other in this, in this marketplace for security. Um, uh, and so, so that I think is, is definitely, uh, an important part of the, of the story. You're absolutely right that the marketplace pressures um, haven't yet moved the governments uh, very much. Uh, but I, that's, the, that's my hope in this kind of work, right? My, work, my hope is to say, look, if you care about establishing uh, a huge information economy, you have to think about these issues quite seriously. And that means that you have to put protection so that people trust their information that when it comes to your shores. Right? So that they know that just because it's on a computer server that you have some authority over doesn't mean that you can grab the information without any kind of due process, et cetera. Uh, so, so I think there's a huge kind of economic interest for governments to come out and say, uh, to put in laws, to put in frameworks, uh, to say your information is secure if you bring it here. Right? So I think that is an appropriate way for the governments of the world to respond, right? To say, look, if you, if you choose to place your information in Germany or if you choose to place it in, in Brazil, we have great uh, laws that help protect this information, okay? That's different than the walling off, we won't let data go outside. That's actually competing with the, for the best, uh, kind of he most healthy regime for, for security and privacy. So I think that is an appropriate field in which competition should occur. And, and I think you're right that um, many ordinary people didn't think that our data was of any interest. But it turns out that surveillance um, become, is such a corrosive uh, feature that once people have the data, uh, especially governments, uh, those governments are often, you know, uh, routinely abuse that data. Uh, and the Chris Christie example is, is one, right? So just imagine, you know, in the machinations behind the scenes where now they know, you know, what the mayor of this, of this town, uh, you know, Googled or uh, et cetera, right? That kind of information could be far more uh, damaging than shutting off uh, and far more uh, uh, um, difficult to kind of... Uh, um, uh, kind of wind through the, the lines of uh, how it was transmitted uh, than, uh, than information about, uh, you know, uh, just shutting off the, the traffic lanes. So, so I think there's huge reasons for ordinary people to be concerned about this because it is, it's fundamentally about the freedom to criticize the government, the freedom to annoy the government, the, the freedom to, uh, to be a, a public uh, citizen.
uh, and not uh, suffer repercussions uh, from that kind of behavior. You're all convinced? <laughs> yes, Miguel. Uh, you mentioned the effect of the, uh, of the market. You mentioned the effect of the market, but I think what you basically had in mind was the effect of the U.S. market because, you know, we have such large companies here. But uh, I don't know anything about this in the rest of the world, very little about in the United States. But are there other uh, major companies in, in other countries that could have that kind of market influence? It's a great question. Um, so you are seeing uh, in some places, you know, head-to-head -head competitions between Chinese companies and American companies. Um, so Twitter and Weibo, for example, you know, are going head-to-head -head in places like Vietnam. Uh, and so uh, it is, it's really interesting to think about, you know, um, uh, whether U.S. companies will, will, you know, how they will fare in, you know, in, in this uh, new world now that people are worried not only about the Chinese government, but they're worried about the U.S. government, right? Uh, before, I think it was a, there was a clear winner in that, in that choice. Now it's not so clear, right? Um, and so, so uh, I'm, I'm not saying that you know, we're the same as the Chinese government or something like that. I don't mean to equate the two um, at all because the purposes of our surveillance may be quite different. Uh, but the possibility for abuse exists in the United States as it does in China as well. Uh, and so, so I think you'll certainly see that. But I think this is a very rapidly uh, changing environment, right? Uh, Silicon Valley's companies, you know, uh, Facebook is uh, a decade old uh, this year, uh, and so not even a decade old as I think of this day, uh, right? Uh, and so, uh, so this is these are all hugely uh, kind of dynamic uh, enterprises, and so who knows where the next Facebook arises, right? Where the next killer app comes from, uh, and so it could it could arise in Indonesia, it could arise in Brazil. It can arise in Finland, so we don't know what where the market pressures will come, right? And so countries are going to be kind of vying to create to be hospitable to to create the climate for that, those kinds of companies to arise, and I don't think that uh, uh, kind of walling off data within within national borders is the is the way to do this. When you say walling off data between countries, among countries, is it data will still be flying through countries, right? You're just speaking about storage of data. So what is, uh, two questions about this. Is it like, if, like the Brazilian government, is it a true remedy for the concerns they have? Would it really work? I know that America may have surveillance abroad, but despite of this undercover operations or anything like that, is that a, an effective remedy? And is, is it really, uh, 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 the, the cost of the remedy is it so high as you were saying because data will still be flying around, right? Google will still have the data, but it will have to process the data in Brazil, I guess, and maybe find a way to merge it with the worldwide data. So I'd like you to know your thoughts about it. Sure. So there's a, there's a kind of, um, it's hard to put your finger in the dike of information flow, right? Uh, and so uh, it's very difficult to actually, uh, if, you know, to put these rules into effect. Uh, it's very hard to say you can't use a service like Fitbit because it, it stores information in the United States, right? That's actually what these laws do. In Australia, you can't transfer health information outside the country, right? What's Fitbit? It's transferring health information outside the country, right, as I've described. So if you use a Fitbit in Australia, you're violating the law, right? Uh, is it, can, Australia, can, can Australia actually enforce that law? No, right? So it turns out to be uh, um, uh, a kind of uh, futile effort. But the really in interesting thing is that the companies that are the biggest, that are the most compliant, will have to comply. And the companies that are the most likely to be, uh, to skirt on the edges, are not going to comply. Right? So it actually, uh, it actually kind of uh, hampers the, the, the most compliant companies and doesn't do anything to actually uh, make your, your, you know, the health data, et cetera, more secure. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, it clearly, I think, you know, in the case of Australia, makes it less secure. You know, so making sure Australian health data stays in Australia is not a way to secure that data, right? Uh, making sure it's on a secure, in a, in a secure place is the way to secure that data, not to make sure it's in Australia. 
right? Because every country has its uh, has uh, hacking issues, uh, and every country can be hacked even from afar, right? We've just seen the Neiman Marcus uh, uh, target Michael's uh, uh, data uh, kind of. Uh, so check your credit card bills, everyone. You know, right? Uh, I, we just got a note from one of these companies uh, um, uh, just uh, yesterday saying, uh, you know, your information may well have been uh, uh, passed on. Uh, and we haven't yet reviewed our credit card statements, but we certainly need to, uh, as do all of you. And we will, you know, so I think that's going to be the nature of our lives for, for time uh, immemorial, basically, um, because uh, there's no way to actually make sure that data doesn't flow across borders. Data is going to flow across borders unless you, so one, one of the possibilities is that you physically disconnect yourself from the internet. Okay, you, you create a parallel internet. Uh, and the idea there is something like a halal internet that Iran is proposing, right? Uh, something that you know, it can control because it's within the country. And that shows you the kind of, you know, the sinister power of data localization, right? Once you can force that data there, then you can make sure that no one who might say something that might uh, anger the, the country is able to get away with that kind of statement. So that kind of free speech, uh, the liberalizing possibilities of the internet are defeated by uh, that kind of uh, behavior. Thanks. Um, so it seems like uh, a lot of the market effects that you're talking about are in relation to cloud technology, so server storing of data and things like that. Do you think that also, I guess, individual nodes, there will be a market effect as well? For instance, Germany switched their um, operating systems to Linux um, because they perceived it as a more secure system. So that would obviously affect Microsoft, who they were using before, and things like that. And you see also cell phones, um, user, end user devices being sold with more security. So do you think those market effects will be bigger or smaller than the, the storage effects? And sure. I guess my second question is, um, there's obviously a lot of interplay between different types of law here, like US constitutional law, international law, maybe IP. So as a student, a law student, which one would you recommend to focus on, or what kind of areas of law do you think are important here? Um, so let me ask, answer the first question first. Um, you're absolutely right that this just um, is so much broader than issues of cloud computing. Um, so data flow is integral to all kinds of digitization, of course. Anything that has a kind of digital component relies upon data. Um, and typically those, those, uh, those devices, uh, et cetera, are not focused on, uh, on political boundaries, right? They, they allow for communication across the world. Um, they share data across the world. And in fact, you know, for when, when you go to the app store, for example, you typically are not told, this I find actually striking, um, you're not told what country the app provider uh, hails from, right? When you download an app, when was the last time you n knew anything about the, where the app provider was based, right? It could be anyone, anywhere. So Angry Birds, for example, my reference, you know, is based in Europe. Uh, many of you, some of you may have known that, many of you may not have known that, right? Uh, but it may not have mattered to you, really, uh, largely, right? Uh, so, so I think there's been a tremendous um, kind of, uh, 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 the digital world, um, like the world of goods, has really, you know, um, uh, gone beyond political boundaries. And it's, and it's what, because it was built in that way uh, from the ground up, because the internet was built in that way, not, uh, not on the basis of political boundaries, there have been efforts then by governments to build the political boundaries back in. And this is the most serious of those efforts, right? Don't let this data go outside the country. This is the effort to really make sure that you have control over what's happening in this kind of new digital environment. Um, and that's the, 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 the worry, ultimately, is that this leads to all kinds of, uh, erodes the promise of this kind of regime, this system, uh, that connects us all uh, seamlessly. So the cover of my book, for example, is the kind of flows of data as expressed in tweets and retweets where people are, people are uh, identified by their geographical location. 
right? So, so it shows you how dynamic the world is. And so it turns out that if you look at that map, um, so uh, the, you know, using often cell phones, right? These mobile devices, not uh, not uh, you know, traditional cloud technologies, for example. Um, the the bright spot in this uh, on the front is Indonesia, which turns out to be an extremely active Twitter uh, country, uh, maybe because Indonesians are very talkative by nature. Uh, and so, uh, so this is, uh, that's the one explanation that's been offered. Uh, that it's a fascinating uh, kind of question of cultural uh, differences. Um, with respect to your second question, your more pragmatic question about what should you do if you're interested in this area, um, I think there are plenty of people doing IP, um, and I teach IP, I teach uh, all these areas that you are talking about, um, but I think that not enough people do international law. Uh, and so it's very rare that you have anyone who does cyber law, who does international law as well. Uh, and so all these things, cyberspace is by nature everywhere and nowhere, right? Any dispute in cyberspace is, is at once a dispute involving a Brazilian, an American, uh, et cetera, uh, with equal uh, likelihood. Um, and so uh, we've done very little in kind of understanding this kind of global nature of, this, uh, of the web. Uh, and so I think a lot more needs to be done about it. And so, uh, you know, to promote my book, my book is an effort to, you know, to kind of figure out uh, uh, rules of the road for, for, for these things. Um, but, uh, but I think there's a lot more work to be done. So it's clearly a, a start uh, towards uh, this kind of understanding. Uh, the problems you've been describing seem to be the problems involved with the behavior of governments and particularly the use of information for uh, oppressive purposes as opposed to protection against foreign uh, uh, threats or intentions or the latter. Uh, if you localize, um, you may protect yourself, you're, you're skeptical, uh, about uh, the foreign uh, uh, intrusions, but you've given the government an enormous power over its own citizens and its own opponents and the ability to control them much better and they can control the information flow to them. Um, so it seems to me that uh, the main problem with localization uh, is that it lends itself so beautifully to uh, repressive governments. Uh, but in terms of the behavior of governments, um, the citizens of one country cannot control or even have a great deal of influence on the behavior of, a gover of another government. So shouldn't the focus in entirely be, so far as we're concerned, with what kind of framework of limitation we can put over our own government? So I, this is, you know, my my hope is that, and so, you know, uh, I've uh, given uh, a, a talks on, in this area, but, uh, you know, focused on different parts of this, and I didn't focus on reforms in the United States. I, I definitely think one of the huge things that has to happen is reform of U.S. law. The reason I go through this no effective protections uh, against uh, U.S. surveillance abroad is to say that there is a huge problem with U.S. law, right? Uh, and uh, so one way to respond to that is to uh, have U.S. law uh, improved. Now, my only hope really, and again, the reason I make this argument in this way is not, you know, if you look at the national discourse, there's been almost no effort to worry about the rights of foreigners. Right, the the Snowden revelations, including by Glenn Greenwald, uh, who understands American politics, I mean, you know, are really focused on, you know, what is happening to Americans. Now, in Brazil, he's focused on what's happening to Brazilians. So he's he's very savvy, right? So uh, so, uh, but when he talks to the to Americans, he's saying this is what he's, uh, the U.S. government is doing to Americans. Uh, and that's been, if you look at the Sensenbrenner bill, uh, Leahy bill, it's the USA Freedom Act. That's the focus. The focus is on improving rights of Americans vis-a-vis -vis, uh, this kind of surveillance. And I think that is woefully inadequate. Now, 
um, the, the commission, the, the Pre President's Intelligence Review Commission, um, actually does, you know, did the first, uh, was the first real effort to open up the rights of foreigners. So there has been some talk now, uh, and I really credit the, the five members of that commission for, uh, for opening up that discussion. Though many people, including myself, think that that probably, the suggestions they had for reform are probably not enough. Uh, so, so uh, but I think that has to be the, the, uh, the response of America. And my goal in this kind of research is to say, look, if we don't respond in this way, then this huge uh, boost to our economy from the internet economy uh, is going to be dramatically reduced because uh, the, the huge trade surpluses we have on, in services will vanish as foreigners no longer trust American companies. Right? That's the effort of Europeans. Uh, the, you know, uh, the new uh, digital Airbus, uh, you know, uh, we're going to create a real competitor across Europe to American services. Uh, and so uh, by having a kind of uh, totally, um, uh, by not respecting the rights of foreigners uh, in our laws, I, I think we're uh, opening up ourselves to that kind of response. And so I think um, we need to, uh, to revise our laws in this process. Sure, Jennifer. Uh, Jennifer, you would have... Uh, um, so I think this question is, the, the answer is just super complicated, and here's why. Um, we have these American companies. They have some data here. We found out that the U.S. government does an immense amount of surveillance, both locally here in the United States and also internationally, usually upstream as data flies across the wire. So what's the market result of that? If I'm a citizen of another country, then maybe I'm more concerned with my country surveilling me than I am with the United States surveilling me. Um, so maybe I'm not so worried about United States holding my data, except for the fact that the United States shares the data with other countries, um, not just the Five Eyes countries, but other countries as well. So there's that concern. Um, there's the concern that um, the U.S. surveillance isn't, doesn't have anything to do with our data localization or where the data is since we do so much surveillance overseas on the wire. Um, and there's the, um, the, the question of what the other governments other than the United States want themselves, which isn't necessarily to protect their citizens' privacy, maybe against the United States government, but certainly not against themselves. And their own and their own access. So the end result is, you know, in order to comfort customers, we see the companies pushing to impl implement more encryption as a market issue, which I think is a unmitigated good. That's been a positive effect. But the 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 ultimate um, question of what the market forces will be is really distorted by the fragmented nature of the fact that there's just different local governments and citizens of those governments want different things and have different levels of impact on what their governments will do and are concerned about different aspects of surveillance because of who that government is and who's likely to be able to put controls on you. So it's, it's pretty clear to me that um, you know, for the companies that are here to be able to say to their customers all around the world, your data is secure, is great. But that market force is, whatever that is, is going to be distorted by the efforts of other countries to say, okay, now if you're going to do business here, you have to store your data here as well. And to me, that's a greater risk to security than it is a benefit. But what does that mean for what's really going to happen or what, we, what the forces we really will see over companies are? There's going to be accommodations by all the, by depending, and the accommodations will differ depending upon how many other nations, how many nations a particular business is operating in and what their various, what, how much money they make there and how much people they have on the ground there. So I just think the story is really complicated by all these factors, and it's hard to see a clear path for what the um, what the answer is going to be, or what the factors are going to be, if you wanted to influence the way this is going to come out. Great, that's that's super uh, helpful, and I think exactly right. Um, and 
You know, I spoke of uh, the response to these uh, revelations as largely based upon, oh, we don't want the U.S. to have access to our data. In fact, that's often subterfuge, right? Um, for one, you know, bald-faced protectionism. We want to, this is an opportunity to promote domestic enterprise, okay? Um, uh, two, it's an opportunity to assert greater control over the internet. Uh, so that's, that's another thing. Um, uh, three, uh, we can um, help um, the, the kind of the companies that are related to us. So this is part of the protectionist impulse. Uh, but we can help these companies that uh, we want to favor because they are supporting our government, et cetera. So there are a lot of, uh, uh, there's uh, clearly this has not been um, uh, entirely uh, you know, the, the, the claim that we're, we're panicked about this American uh, surveillance is, is sometimes uh, used uh, for this, uh, to hide other uh, real motives. In fact, many countries, when they saw what the U.S. was doing, their real response was, why aren't we doing the same thing? Okay, so their response was envy, not, uh, not uh, kind of shock or horror. Uh, they wanted to build up the same capacity. I think India has been one of the leaders in thinking in, in that kind of approach. Uh, and so, and you have countries like Vietnam, et cetera. A lot of these data localization uh, requirements actually originated in these countries, if you look at this history, before the NSA revelations, before June of this year, of this last year. So, uh, so they aren't really truly motivated by this. They just got uh, revived by the, the legitimate concern. Now, mind you, I think there's a hugely legitimate concern here, uh, but that legitimate concern is being hijacked for these other uh, less uh, uh, benign purposes. So, and I agree with you, Jennifer, that the, the, the kind of response here is, is extremely complicated. It's, it's hard to predict exactly how this all works out, but the real concern, the fu fundamental concern is that the kind of global nature of the web becomes, uh, is eroded, becomes, beco it becomes hard to imagine services that were uh, offering themselves around the world, right? Uh, the Fitbit that, uh, you know, is, uh, is able to be used around the world or any service uh, that might be able to be used around the world because now you need kind of local silos for data. Uh, that data can't cross borders. This means that you can't uh, collect information from a variety of sources and, and compare what's happening in different jurisdictions, which could be a huge uh, um, problem for uh, big data um, analytics. Um, and it also means that uh, the kind of the new technologies where goods are embedded with services, right? Uh, so goods and services are, are come hand in hand, okay, um, uh, are, are not going to arrive at the same pace or in the same way. Uh, and so you've, we've got, you know, an incredible future uh, of people uh, innovating uh, goods embedded with services, uh, but that future may well be uh, forestalled by uh, this, uh, this effort. So... One last question. Okay, all right, one last question. So, so I was glad to see the direction the last exchange went. Um, the, the revelations that took place are, are useful for consciousness raising and detrimental for being uh, distracting. Um, the, the thing that we have plenty of evidence of is that there are many different actors who are very aggressive about pervasive monitoring. Some of them have more skill and more reach, others less, but the reality that we need to start from is an assumption that every actor in the game is trying to subvert what's going on. That's a model we don't know how to protect ourselves against, but we can't protect ourselves against it unless we start with that model. And you, uh, you're, you're certainly right that the immediate reactions that, that we see uh, many actors in this uh, express are for their own immediate uh, purposes. Again, that's just distraction. Um, trying to, uh, the, the thing you said earlier that, that I'm, I'm finding intriguing uh, to wonder how we can take advantage of is there is economic opportunity here in being able to make legitimate promises of protection, even though I haven't a clue how they're going to actually deliver it. 
It's a great question. How do we um, create a system whereby you trust your information coming to our country? So Iceland, a little while back, decided to create itself as a new media haven, right? So what it did was it created a set of laws that said, you know, journalists are going to be, so it, it, what it did, they looked around the world and they said, what are all the stuff that protects media, okay? So what are the various laws around the world that protect media? We'll just combine them all and offer them all as a package here, okay? Uh, and so Iceland, you know, so there was uh, some effort by, you know, uh, WikiLeaks was, you know, toying with Iceland. There are all these companies that have, you know, thought about relocating to Iceland because of that kind of hospitality to be an information provider to the world. Uh, and I think, um, but I think you're gonna see clever countries uh, trying to uh, make themselves more available. Now that was more in the free speech, uh, kind of we're gonna protect people who speak. Uh, but now there's all these concerns about security and privacy. Um, and so we want, you know, you can imagine similar efforts to do that. The worry about protecting privacy is that sometimes, again, data localization can arise uh, in this context of protecting privacy. You can't send information, private information abroad, say like British Columbia has a law like this. You can't send, uh, if you are a British uh, Columbia governmental entity, you can't send information outside Canada, okay, of, of, about Canadians, okay? If you hold information about British Columbia people uh, or Canadians, you can't send it outside Canada. Well, there's no reason for British Columbia citizens to be more, to think that they're better protected in British Columbia than they are in Seattle, right? Uh, it doesn't, you know, in fact, it might well erode their protections to do this, right? And in fact, the original impulse of this was uh, 2004, uh, the British Columbia, uh, you know, Government Workers Employees Union was concerned about loss of jobs, about outsourcing. Uh, and so they said, let's uh, stop stuff from going to American companies. IBM was the, was the threat, right? But there's no reason to think that if it's held in a government computer by British Columbia in, in, uh, uh, in Vancouver, it's more secure than held by IBM somewhere else outside the country, right? Uh, and so we can't uh, confuse geography for security. We should focus on security directly. Um, so thank you.